Welcome to our episode on geopolitics with Alex. Sorry for the little break, I've been traveling around, but with those travels always comes new ideas. And today's episode is basically going to be uh, about the Munich Security Conference. Now, you will all know that the Munich Security Conference is an annual event. It started in 1963 and it basically brings together political leaders, civil servants, military personnel, uh, experts and journalists from all around the world. I think about 70 to 80 countries usually represented and somewhere between 350 and 500 people. Now, quite often the Munich Security Conference, which takes place at Bayerische Hof, a hotel in Bavaria in Munich, uh, is about transatlantic relations. So there's a very strong element of basically Europeans and Americans uh, getting together. Now, that was before uh, Russia attacked Ukraine. This year, it was very much about the global issues. So it wasn't only Americans and Europeans, but a lot of other representatives as well, from China, from India, in general from the global south. Uh, no one, uh, of course, from uh, Russia. So what I'll try to do today uh, is to give you my assessment uh, as we're approaching the first anniversary of the beginning uh, of the fully scaled, full scaled uh, war. And I'll give you my assessment uh, in light of what I was hearing both in the corridors uh, and in the seminars and in the discussions of Munich. And I'll do those through three points. The first one uh, is about an end of an era. The second one is about the issues at stake. And the third one is about something that I'm now working on also with the book. And I'll call it the triangular power. And then I'll give you a conclusion. So uh, here we go. I, I think one of the things to come out of Munich is nothing new in the discussions that we've had in this lecture series. But there was a very strong sentiment that we have now come to an end of an era namely the end of the post-Cold War era. And this you could hear everywhere. And people were trying to understand that what does this actually mean? Because of course, you know, during our 30-year holiday from history, many of us believed that most countries in the world would shift towards liberal democracy and social market economy and uh, globalization, the issues that we have uh, discussed here. But uh, as I've noted before, I think one of the big mistakes that the West did in the beginning of the war was to give an assumption or have an assumption that the rest of the world would follow suit uh, in its strong support, even emotional support for Ukraine. But of course, this was not the case. And I think there are two sets of figures that you need to look at here. The first one is the classic UN General Assembly vote, where 140 plus countries uh, condemned Russia, 35 uh, abstained and four voted in favor of Russia. We've discussed this uh, on numerous occasions. And there, of course, the observation was that the 35 countries that abstained uh, they were over half of the world's population, of course, including China and India. But I think the more significant issue to understand here is that there's only roughly 40 to 45 countries that have actually sanctioned Russia. So it's all well and good to condemn, to basically give a statement that we think that Russia has violated the UN Charter and international law, but it's a completely different issue to do something about it. And to do something about it is partially about sanctions, which the West has been involved in, roughly a quarter of the world's countries, and then partially, of course, about financial and military support. 
So when we have come now to an end of an era, the end of the post-Cold War era, we have to understand that an era is dead, but a new one has yet to be born. And this is, I think, part of the discussions that we saw at the Munich Security Conference. Now, my second observation uh, is about the issues uh, at stake. And the way in which I tried to simplify this, and it's something that I'm trying to also discuss in my book, is that there are really three main issues that are, are, are being discussed when we're trying to understand the new order. The first one is the order itself. The second one are the values linked to that order. And the third one are the poli policies linked to that order. So let's look at each of them uh, in turn. So what do I mean when I talk about an order? Well, it's really about the institutions that govern the order, the principles that govern the order, and the rules that govern the order. This is the conversation that we have when we talk about a so-called rules-based world order. Now, in many ways, the rules-based world order has been a liberal world order. And as we have discussed before, it's something that basically was created in many ways in the image of the West and to reflect the power dynamics of uh, the post-World War II uh, era. That order is now being challenged, and I'll come back to this in a second, by China and by Russia. They want to have a different order, probably a more uh, autocratic or authoritarian order. Uh, and this is the debate that we're having at this particular moment. The, uh, it's also very much linked to you know, what a state is allowed to do and not. And here's where we come to the second issue at stake, which in my mind is values. Now here, let's park democracy and freedom on the side. For me, this is more about human rights, and then especially human rights from a perspective, is it a human right of the individual, as we in the West often think, or the collective, as for instance is thought of quite often in China. And at the same time, it's about uh, values about the role of a state. Is it about the sovereignty of a state or the non-intervention? And here is a big debate because in the West, sovereignty in many cases have been pooled. In other words, we have decided to try to find common solutions to common problems in shared institutions. The European Union is an example thereof. Or trade agreements between, say, the United States and, and, and Europe. Or is it about non-intervention, where the narrative, especially for authoritarian regimes is that you're not allowed to intervene to anything that happens in a state. This is very much linked to a debate that's uh, called the right to protect. Uh, uh, it's a principle, basically. That are you allowed to intervene in a state which is violating human rights? So the first one is about order. The second one is about values. But then not more importantly, but equally important, it's also about policies. Because we all understand that, you know, the idea of a world order, uh, be it value-based or not, is that we deal with common problems. So for the global south, for instance, it's a lot about how do we deal with climate change? How do we deal with energy? How do we deal with trade? How about infrastructure? How about health? How about food security? So it's this interplay, I think, that is at stake. Uh, in other words, what is the order? What are the values? And how do we collectively deal with the policies? And this was very much part of the debate, I think, uh, at Munich. And I do recommend to all of you um, a report or kind of a book was written by the Munich Security Conference. It's called Re-Vision, so Re-Vision. 
uh, and we will post a link where you can find that report. It's a very good sort of picture of all the different issues at stake. Slightly different from what I'm portraying here, but going along the same lines. And here's where we come to my third point, and I want to test you uh, and test my thesis with you. So this is going to be a part of the book uh, and, and the idea. So here we go. I call it a triangular power or the pendulum of power. And for me, it's about three key players that are determining the world order. And here is how it goes. Here's how it goes. On one side, you have the global west. You can call it the global north or the global west. That is essentially the United States, the European Union, and their value-based democratic allies. Say, for instance, Australia, New Zealand, um, you know, South Korea uh, or Japan. Uh, on the other side and the extreme, you have the Global East, which I simplify as China and then, to a lesser extent, uh, Russia. And they look at things from an authoritarian perspective and they want to change the liberal world order. The Global West looks at things from a democratic perspective and they want to maintain the liberal world order. So these are sort of the two extremes uh, of the debate. You know, it, it's the one that President Biden has defined as, you know, democracies versus autocracies. But you see, my argument here is that there is a third power, not a center, but player, and that's the global south. And pardon me already now for simplifying, but for me that basically means Asia, you know, led in many ways by, by India, uh, the African continent, 54 countries, and Latin America. These are basically the countries that have sat on the fence in this conflict between Russia and Ukraine, or the global East and the global West. They are the ones who've been neutral. Yes, most of them have condemned, but no countries from Africa or Latin America have sanctioned Russia, only a few uh, from Asia. And you see, they are not so much worried about the ideological or systemic perspectives of the order, whether it's democratic or authoritarian, because some of the countries are sort of hybrids or in between. They are more looking for the policies, the substance, and a fair distribution of power, or what quite often in international relations is called agency, a, a, a sort of stake uh, in the issues. So my argument is that you have this pendulum of power that if we think that it's been with the global West and the liberal world order, it's been swinging towards the global East and an authoritarian world order. Uh, and the one that's going to determine where it actually settles is the global South. So there is this, how would I put it, uh, a battle for the hearts and the minds of the global south. And if I really simplify, the Chinese and to a certain extent the Russians have been very shrewd and in many ways uh, intelligent in the way in which they have created path dependencies and relationships with the global south, either through uh, infrastructure, cooperation, or basically cooperation uh, without at uh, attachments. Whereas the West has quite often, and, and sorry for using the expression, been sort of trying to portray the moral high ground. And of course there is a historic burden that the West has to carry because of its colonial uh, past uh, in a lot of countries and areas of uh, the global south. So the triangular po triangle of power is going to be a pendulum of power which swings between the global west and the global east and is going to be decided by the global south. 
And here's where I come to my conclusion. So, as I said in the beginning, uh, an era has ended and a new one has yet to be born. So we live in this period of in-between or interregnum, uh, as uh, things uh, should be called. And my thinking here is the following. I think the West needs to wake up and smell the coffee if it wants to win the battle of the liberal world order it needs to drive what I have called a dignified foreign policy. It needs to give more say to the global south. It needs to show more respect. It needs to be very much more concrete in the cooperation, whether it's about vaccine distribution, whether it's about trade, uh, whether it's about climate change. It needs to show willingness to cooperate to win the hearts and the minds of the global south. Now, on the other side, you have the Global East, so China and, and Russia. I don't believe that the rest of the world or the Global South actually wants really close path dependencies. But the Chinese and the Russians are actually very transactional in what they're doing. So they have this sort of cooperation without limits. And that's a big difference to how the West is dealing with the Global South. So my argument is that the Global South will determine the new world order or how it settles. And of course, and we'll talk about this later, we do have three options. One is a global order where we have common rules. Two is a regional order where we start looking a little bit more inbound. And three is disorder. I, of course, would prefer a global order, but as always, we don't live in a perfect world. So it'll probably be a mix of a global order, a regional order, and a disorder. These were my takeaways from the Munich Security Conference. First, we have now the end of the Cold War era, post-Cold War era. Two, the issues at stake are about the global order, values and policies. And three, there is a pendulum of power which is swinging between the global west and the global east. It's going to be decided by the global south, but we don't know where exactly it's going to settle. Thanks a lot for watching and listening. Keep your comments coming. I really appreciate them. America made its declaration of independence for the world.